Hi there. My name is Lorna Fillingham, and I want to just briefly introduce to you a project that has been run by Brighton and Sussex Medical School and funded by the Wellcome Trust. The project is a creative one that look, aims to look at the um, lived experiences of families who have a child with a rare genetic condition, and my daughter definitely um, fits that criteria. The um, people running it, uh, Professor Bobby Farsides and Dr Rich Gorman, have um, had us doing all sorts of lovely creative things. All of the participants um, have met each other via Zoom, and that's how all, all of this um, project has been run. What they've had us doing is, from the very start, we did creative writing. And then we've done stop frame animation, we've done collage, we've done um, graphic medicine, so we've been doing some drawings. And, but the most recent um, project has involved us do, writing poetry. And this has resulted in a book called Helix of Love. Now, this book, if you read it all the way through, takes you on a journey, on a journey of our, on, of our lives. There are six um, poets who have contributed to this book, and like I say, I'm very proud that I am one of these people. When our daughter um, was born, we did not know that we would be um, walking on a path less travelled, as it were. Um, none of the um, books that were out there seem to fit the criteria of um, what we were going through. Um, my daughter missed her milestones. She was, um, we had a long diagnostic journey. It was about seven or eight years before she, we actually got a diagnosis for her. This book takes you on our journey through our lives and that of the other poets. And I think what runs through this book is is love um it's the live like i say the lived experiences of ourselves and be, even though we all um, participated via zoom and we all come from different parts of the uk there were themes that ran through everybody's experiences so in this book you will read about um people's um medical appointments how we can sometimes be um feel that we're fighting for um, for our children to be included in society. Um, it's a book that I wish I could have read years ago. I'm glad that, like I say, I, as you can pretty tell, I'm very, very proud to have been part of this. Um, I think all professionals, as many professionals as we can, need to read this book. I think it needs to reach families like ours. Um, I'm going, I am going to read to you in a second one of my poems um, that does detail those medical appointments, but then you'll be able to hear a much fuller presentation from Dr Rich um, Garman. Uh, I, I, I do hope you enjoy, enjoy this. So the poem that I'm going to read to you is a poem called See Me, Here I Am. I'm just reading it out of the book, so if I'm looking down, I do apologise, but I hope you like it. Her smiles, her giggles, her whole sense of being dissipate slowly as the doctor listens to the heartbeat thump. He observes the chest rise, the pulse rate, the breath count. His cold fingers press onto her abdomen. He rolls her that way and this. He weighs, he measures, he compares her with others. Amalgamating thought and reason. Squeezing, monitoring, testing to find what he knows. Therein losing sight of my daughter. Not a statistic, not a measurement, but a person who glows. And I hope you like that. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentation. And the whole book can be is available online, which hopefully you will have got the links and everything um, shared to have a good read. And please, please do read it. it um, we've put our hearts and souls into this. Thank you. Goodbye.
Hello everyone, it's lovely to be invited to be part of this and speak to you virtually. My name is Rich Gorman, I'm a research fellow at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. In this recording, I'm going to briefly talk to you about the research that my wonderful colleague, Professor Bobby Farsides and I have been doing as part of the Wellcome Trust Ethical Preparedness in Genomic Medicine Project, where we've been working with families affected by rare genetic conditions to explore different ways of capturing and sharing important stories and messages about their lives as a means to ensure that the current genomic enthusiasm in healthcare services is informed by a meaningful understanding of people's experiences in the medical arena and beyond. Bobby and I have a great interest in the idea of stories and narrative being central to healthcare. We believe that ensuring healthcare professionals are ethically prepared to deal with the rapid expansion and mainstreaming of genomic medicine services within the NHS requires them having an understanding of what it means to access genomic services from a patient and family perspective. We've been working with a group of people with lived experience of rare genetic disease in their families to explore different ways of creating representations, stories and conversations about the family experience of rare disease. Now, we know that scholars across a variety of different academic disciplines have created a really extensive literature that illuminates the complex and emotional familial experience of rare genetic disease from a diverse range of perspectives. Building on this, our research is interested in exploring how the affective and promissory discourses surrounding genomics are reshaping the social worlds and lived experiences of those within the rare disease community who have been offered whole genome sequencing. Similarly to disability scholar Kirsty Lydiard, our aims are to enable our participants to situate their stories against and amongst the myriad stories already told about their lives by experts. All of our participants in our research have direct experience of genetic disease within their families. Everyone was a uh, parent of children affected by rare genetic conditions, uh, different genetic conditions, but many having a significant level of caring responsibility as a result. Participants' children were affected by a range of different but frequently complex physical and cognitive impacts. Rather than a shared condition or diagnosis, it was the shared experience of rare disease that brought our participants together. Their experiences of life with rare genetic conditions had been profoundly shaped by the novel diagnostic prospects promised by genomics. In social research, Methodological creativity and plurality is increasingly recognised as enabling more nuanced perspectives, creating different modalities of knowledge, allowing for engagement with affective, multisensory knowledges, and creating more participatory approaches. Research is increasingly challenged to evoke, not just explain, and experiment with finding new ways to use the narratives collected in research. These kind of theoretical and methodological trends, along with the support and encouragement from our participants who have directly informed and guided our research, have led us to engage with arts-based research methods, with the hope that such might express and evoke aspects of lived experience of rare disease in productive and affective ways beyond what's possible through more conventional social scientific registers, such as interviews, or focus groups. Now, we know that stories are really integral to medical care. Story forms the basis of medical care in the narratives that patients bring to their doctors and in the narrative the doctor constructs in relation to the patient. Narrative medicine refers to clinical practice fortified by narrative competence the capacity to recognise, absorb, metabolise, interpret and be moved by stories of illness. Narrative medicine forms an emotional responsiveness. It assembles and conveys what symptoms mean to patients. Patients' particular perspectives on their symptoms and recognises patient agency in living with and facing predicaments.
By paying attention to underlying or hidden narratives, doctors can understand additional dimensions of their patients with beneficial effects on patient care and outcomes. Key to understanding the place of narrative in medicine is listening to patients, being curious, spending time thinking about people's stories and priorities. The use of stories and narratives is something that's quite common across uh, multiple NHS trusts. There's a sense that listening to and learning from stories can help healthcare professionals understand patient experience and thus improve healthcare delivery. Some trusts have even begun to develop whole toolkits on using stories to improve patient, carer and staff experiences and outcomes. For us, we started initially by working with a writing tutor and we organised a series of creative writing workshops where each session involved different creative writing exercises that were designed to enable both novice and experienced writers to begin to build confidence in expressing lived experience. The aim was to enable people to convey how they, as patients, families, carers, families affected by rare disease, live their everyday lives outside of a healthcare setting. The project wanted to provide an outlet for examining patients' hopes, families' hopes, expectations, worries, and reflect on what everyday life is like at a time when often so much in the media and in the clinic focuses on the promise of genomic technologies, genomic medicine, there are substantial benefits to asking people to write about their lives. Using writing as a method of inquiry raises the possibility for producing different knowledge and producing knowledge differently. Writing creates a very different modality of representation. It allows participants to give the researcher their stories and words in an exact form. The pieces of writing that were produced are powerful evocative and revealing, highlighting what everyday life is like for the people who live with and care for those with rare genetic conditions. These stories do not necessarily provide answers or solutions. Instead, their value lies in helping to unfold the implications of experiences and illuminating what is often submerged or eclipsed by wider clinical frames. We've also been utilising collage as a form of qualitative inquiry. Collage is a modality of expression which involves repurposing and juxtaposing fragments and offers space for, again, different modes of representation and different knowledge. This is a collage produced by one of our participants who explained, it's supposed to kind of chart in a very simplified way. My feelings of guilt from my son's birth, well, actually pre-birth, to death, which is not to say there went a lot of other feelings along the way, but I think guilt is a common one among mothers, and particularly mothers of disabled children, and I wanted to acknowledge that. We've also experimented with animation, where again, working with a local artist and facilitator, we designed a series of workshops to take participants through the process of producing their own stop motion animation film. The filmmaking workshops often spark conversations, recollections and stories of both similarity and solidarity amongst group members. The process of smoothing and sculpting plasticine in turn smoothed the way for uncomfortable conversations. Many participants reflected that their stories emerged through the practice of doing and making. Animating gave participants an opportunity to reflect on their concerns, the challenges they face, and the moments and encounters in their lives that mattered. Animation can bring into view what cannot be captured by a camera. It provides freedom to tell a story, but also freedom to choose how to tell it. And to our delight, this, this work appealed to uh, several of our participants who had previously opted out of research that had been based around more textual creative practices, highlighting the appeal and visual research methods and their ability to draw in different voices, which I think is important in understanding the wide variety of perspectives and experiences when we think about rare disease and disability. Again, 
a few of the animations produced through our workshops focused on genomics itself. No one animated a next generation sequencer, whatever one of those looks like. And you know, no, one, no one even animated strands of DNA. But instead, animation offered us an insight into the wider social context that remains and the everyday realities of families caught up amidst genomic excitement. So many hopes are placed on genomics, yet the films reveal that often this is only the start of an even lengthier clinical journey. And there is a need for careful communication around the prospects of genomics as a panacea or the end of a journey. Finally, we supported our participants to co-edit a collection of poetry entitled Helix of Love, a collection of poems from parents of children with rare genetic conditions. This has just been published and is freely available online via a link I'll share at the end of this presentation or the QR code that's on the screen right now. Poetry allows medicine to address not only the symptoms of illness, but the experience, including the emotional response to health and medicine. Poetry can both support public engagement and understanding of clinical research, whilst aiding the training of healthcare professionals by placing research into emotive contexts. Some medical journals, such as the Journal of the American Medical Association, have even introduced sections inviting the submission of poems and poetry commentaries relating to the medical experience. Many of the poems in our collection attempt to put a human face to the dispassionate prose of clinical communication, reminding readers that patients and children have phenotypes beyond their medicalized characteristics and relationships stronger than those designated by the genealogy. What's also been really inspiring about this work is the way that it's been received by the medical community, who have been really open about how useful these kinds of affective outputs are. Helix has received critical acclaim from stakeholders across the genomics sector. It's become part of library and museum collections and was recently incorporated into the NHS-led International Genomics Education and Training Summit, where it was distributed as a training resource to delegates from over 49 countries. There's some wonderful poems here, um, which unfortunately I don't have time to read out fully, but I do recommend having a look at the full version, which you can scroll through online. Ultimately, these methods, although very different and arts-based, have enabled our research into rare disease to engage and center different kinds of narratives, different kinds of emotions, and provide different ways of knowledge representation, production, and dissemination. We know that the mediums through which stories are told are important in affecting what stories are told highlighting the generative potential of arts-based methods to create space for different stories and knowledge to emerge. And personally, in our research, we found that arts-based methods can create a space where people feel comfortable to explore different narratives, centre different identities, and challenge assumptions about life with rare conditions. The stories, Films and pieces of art our participants produced shine a light on many facets of everyday life and clinical care. They highlight, often with humour and emotion, the importance of language and interpersonal relationships and evoke the personhood of the people whose genomes are at the centre of cutting edge science. They make visible those who are too often forgotten or rendered passive. They remind us of the labour parents undertake as carers for their children and the persistence of seemingly simple yet everyday barriers to accessing quality care and societal understanding. As the quote on the screen explains, I think people see you swan-like, gliding along, having these silly ideas about how easy you're making it look. They don't see any of all the bits that are going on behind it. Writing about nappies and children being resuscitated and all of that kind of thing. I suppose I feel it allows me to tell people what it's really like. With researchers increasingly challenged to think more creatively about how they might engage different stakeholders in their work beyond the written form and academic articles behind paywalls.
Our creative methods have also provided us with powerful resources for research, communication and education. The films created by our participants through their animation have already been utilised as a powerful resource within the education of our medical students. Getting them to think about the importance of listening to patients, recognising family expertise. And we know that paying attention to narratives can support healthcare professionals to understand additional dimensions to their patients. And we know that stories have lives, that stories travel, that stories remain memorable. And we hope that the creative outputs produced by our participants might prompt greater understanding of the lived experience of families affected by rare disease. Narratives can serve as a reminder of how medical practices are experienced by patients and their families, but also how medicine is situated within, against and alongside everything else in people's lives. Thank you for listening to this recording. I realise in this presentation I've sped through and have not had time to really show lots of the wonderful creative pieces produced by our participants. It's one of the challenges of doing this, this more creative work, compressing it into a presentation format. So if you'd like to read, watch or view with more time, then there are various links on the screen um, that you're more than welcome to follow up with. And please do get in touch if you have any questions. It'd be great to hear from you. Thank you.